statistical seminar series. My name is uh, Paul Colm. I'm the Associate Director Has Department of meeting. Biostatistics and Biomedical Informatics and in, uh, MHRI. Um, just a uh, um, little bit about myself. Uh, I've been uh, doing statistical consulting and medical research for, well, over 30 years. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in the context of medical schools, um, teaching hospitals. So um, I've also um, been on um, several American Heart Association study sections uh, for a few years. I was the statistical editor of Jack Interventions, uh, the Journal of American College, College of Cardiology. Um, and so I've um, had quite a bit of experience in doing a lot of different uh, statistical analyses um, and have given a lot of thought to uh, statistics and particularly uh, teaching statistics. And so um, this, uh, uh, as you might expect uh, of a first, uh, the first session about statistics is to do an introduction to statistics, although my guess is that probably most of you haven't um, seen or heard an introduction like this one, but we'll, we'll see. So just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, if you're not muted, um, please mute yourself. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, since this isn't a uh, face-to-face audience, send your questions to the chat. Um, <clears throat> the session is being recorded, uh, so it'll be available uh, in the future if you want to replay it. And um, at the end, if you would provide some feedback, I think there's going to be an option somewhere to do that. Uh, we really appreciate uh, really appreciate that. And if you have uh, any questions that don't get answered, uh, just please email me at the uh, at my email ad MedStar email address, and we will uh, I, I will re I'll respond to you. So um, has joined the meeting. This is the outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, we're going to uh, look at the uh, current p-value crisis. Um, you may not have thought of that as a crisis, but uh, uh, it's actually a crisis that's been going on for quite a while. And then I'm going to talk about statistical analysis when you analyze um, data from research study. What are you actually doing? And then I'm going to talk about a p-value and what that what that means. And then um, I'm going to talk about what I've termed the pervasive misuse of p-values in medical research and uh, look at some alternatives to p-values. <clears throat> and then I want to end up with um, a, uh, how we can better present the methods and results uh, of statistical analyses uh, in the literature. So um, a few years ago, at uh, American Statistical Association Forum, um, the discussion sort of got into this kind of circularity, um, why uh, colleges and grad schools teach that uh, the P should be equal or less than 0.05. And then the answer being that, well, that's what scientific community and jour journal editors use. And then, of course, the question is, why do they use that? And it's because of what they were taught <laughs> in college or grad school. So this concern was brought to the attention of the uh, ASA board. And so they convened uh, a, a, a meeting um, to uh, discuss this issue. And it wasn't just the um, uh, forum discussion, but uh, there have been some um, articles in the literature over the last several years that have uh, called into question the whole idea of statistical analysis and um, hypothesis testing. Um, for example, that science is dirtiest secret, it's based on a flimsy foundation, uh, numerous deep laws, and then someone who's trying to be um, a little, and introduce a little uh, laughter to it. Um, that the um, hypothesis testing has more flaws than Facebook's privacy policies. And then uh, kind of more serious kind of um, um, ideas that um, uh, data analysis is not being performed by people who really understand what they're doing. Um, that's true, although not uh, 
entirely true. And then um, an article that appeared, uh, appeared in Nature um, called Sci the Scientific Method Statistical Errors. Um, and so that ended up, uh, it's a really good article, and, and I have it as a reference uh, if you're interested in reading. It's very readable. It's not technical. Uh, but it's one of the most highly viewed nature articles um, in recent years. And so um, the American uh, Statistical Association then uh, met, um, uh, I think in 2016 it was, to uh, address this issue. Um, and uh, the uh, outcome of that was um, that they acknowledged that some of the um, uh, problems with hypothesis testing, the use of p-values, and um, sort of, um, you know, gave some examples of rather severe <laughs> or um, reactions to that. In fact, one scientific journal decided to not uh, use, uh, to ban p-values from uh, their journal at all. Um, and so um, the actual um, arguments for and against using p-values is actually goes way back to the beginning, um, going on a century ago. And the uh, <clears throat> two primary um, players in this were a couple of statisticians, uh, one you're probably really familiar with, R.A. Fisher, and the other one, Neiman, which you may not have heard of. But anyway, um, the um, controversy over, over hypothesis testing and the use of p-values, um, as I mentioned, has been going on for some time. And then uh, uh, a um, article that appeared along with the uh, ASA statement on p-values uh, was entitled Abandoned Statistical Significance. And then <clears throat> the um, uh, a quote that I, which I, I came across one time, but uh, I've sort of lost the reference now, is that uh, statistical significance should be deleted from the researcher's vocabulary. So um, in, in terms of the history, um, it, uh, it began back in the 1920s uh, with Fisher and Neiman. Um, and Fisher's view was that the p-value should be viewed as a continuum. And then if it was small enough, then that in a sense, gave you permission to replicate your experiment or replicate your study. Uh, Fisher was in um, agriculture, uh, and uh, he's actually the one who developed uh, what we know today as the analysis of variance. Um, and so um, his idea was that the p-value was uh, just sort of, you kind of view that as a uh, as sort of a gateway to continuing your experiments or continuing your research. Neiman, on the other hand, is the one who actually developed the idea, the concept of null hypothesis testing. And in this idea, you set the alpha error rate or the p-value before you do the experiment. And then you do power and sample size calculations. And then based on the alpha error rate uh, that you've set, uh, you have two decisions to make. Either you reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis. And the uh, interesting uh, thing about uh, P less than 0.5 uh, is that <clears throat> Fisher is actually the one who um, came up with this, but it was only because uh, in talking to an associate who asked him, well, what would be, you know, uh, a um, p-value or a uh, error rate level, error rate uh, level that you would deem as you know giving you permission to continue your your research, and he just kind of in an offhand way said, "Well, probably less than 0.05." Um, and I'll also point out that Neiman uh, never suggested 0.05 as a um, alpha error rate uh, level, so it's kind of an interesting. Um, that then in the ensuing years, then uh, people sort of put together the two views and all hypothesis testing and then came up with the um, 0.05 as the uh, kind of the acceptable level of rejecting the null hypothesis. So what I want to do is, is uh, talk about 
uh, the um, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, ideas behind hypothesis testing, and um, and then we'll take a look at what um, uh, what we can sort of you know glean from that and how we would apply it. And uh, in uh, just last year, the ASA came out with a um, declaration that um, that based on their article uh, review of articles and all the discussions they've had that um, it, they say it's time to stop using the term statistically significant entirely, uh, nor should variants such as significantly different P less than 05 non-significant survive. And uh, so that's the official position of the American Statistical Association. Um, and, and so I want to look at what what is meant by hypothesis testing and uh, uh, what it uh, what it means, what it doesn't mean. So, the um, couple of things that I want to look at as far as um, the misuse of p-values, and I've, as I mentioned, turned it the pervasive misuse of p-values in medical research. Really, two things that, uh, in my view, statistical significance has become the sole criteria for meaningful or important or acceptable results. Uh, um, and you say, well, that's that's kind of a strong statement, but I think it shows up in the way that results are presented uh, in, in the literature, and I'll talk about that a little later. And then the other uh, misuse of p-values is relates to the concept of multiplicity, which uh, I'll, I'll talk about. But first, I want to get into uh, when we do hypothesis testing, what we are actually doing. So we start out with the a uh, really basic idea here, and probably the most important idea, is that when we do research, um, we, draw a we draw a sample from the population of interest. And <clears throat> here we, we would define the population of everyone of, uh, of interest in the, in the universe. So this might be, um, you know, patients with colon cancer or, you know, um, <coughs> patients with heart disease, whatever. But anyway, when you do research, Actually, you can't um, get data from the entire population. So what you do is you draw a sample from this population. And of course, the basic question then is, is the sample representative of the population? Now, in the view that we're going to discuss today, uh, that question is not particularly relevant, but in a, uh, when we later in a later session, when I talk about a different view of statistics, that's the main. Uh, concern. So here's um, sort of schematics, and I, I hope that this sort of helps um, understand what we're doing. Um, and the <coughs> idea here <coughs> uh, is um, from what we, uh, from the frequentist view of hypothesis testing, and um, the other view that we'll discuss later on in the in sessions is the Bayesian view. But uh, for the next couple of sessions, we're going to be talking about the frequentist view of hypothesis testing. And so the view here is that uh, if you are interested in a particular population parameter, so we'll use the mean uh, as an example here, uh, that it is in the, there's a fixed, um, there's a true mean in the population. And so when you sample uh, from the population, the question is then, um, does that, how well does that that uh, mean from your sample represent the mean of the population? And so the idea here is from the frequentist view is that if you were able to sample over and over and over again from the population and each of the samples would have a mean that the mean of those means um, of size n, whatever the n might be, um, the, the number of uh, individuals you have in your sample, that the mean of all those means will equal the population parameter. And so this particular view is based on the idea of repeated random sampling and that 
you would have random sampling uh, variability. So um, let me ex um, try and illustrate this by looking at a population here of diastolic blood pressures. Now, obviously, I don't have a, you know, millions and millions of values here. This is, you know, 144 is what I could fit on the, on the slide. But let's say this is our population of interest, and uh, we would, we never know the true population mean. But let's say that in this case we do, and it turns out the mean of all these blood pressures here is 76. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw uh, a number of random samples from this population, and I'm going to then look at what we call a sampling distribution. And so here is a, several um, random samples from this population with an N of five. So the uh, values here are the individual uh, patient values. And then I've calculated a mean for each of those samples. And so you can see that some of these means from my samples are very close to the population mean of 76, but some aren't. And what I have here is what's called a sampling distribution. So uh, the, a sampling distribution is a, um, a distribution of statistics, uh, a mean or a proportion or an odds ratio. Um, it's not uh, distribution of the data itself. And so there are a couple of terms here that are really important to understand is that when we talk about variability in a distribution of data, uh, what we calculate then is the standard deviation. So that's uh, a measure of the variability of a distribution of data. The concept of a standard error, though, is variability of a distribution of a statistic, for example, the mean. So the standard error of a mean is actually the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size n. So you can see that a standard error is dependent on sample size. And that will, as we'll see, that makes uh, uh, a big difference in uh, what we can say about our, about our sample. Okay, so let me uh, try and show this again uh, another way where I have samples from my population. Uh, so here are five, sample size five. So here are the individual data points. Here's the mean of those uh, five data points. And I've calculated uh, the standard error of the mean, um, which is the standard deviation in this case, divided by five. And then from that, then I can calculate what we call a confidence interval. In this case, I've calculated the 95% confidence interval, which um, is, is uh, related to the normal distribution, but uh, probably most everybody has uh, experience with looking at the normal distribution. But the point here I want to make is that the um, population mean is fixed. Okay, in other words, what um, varies then is the confidence interval about the mean. And so the idea of a 95% confidence interval, what we mean by that is that if you were able to do this sampling over and over again, that five times out of every 100 random samples, the confidence interval would not include the population mean. Okay. So that's the um, uh, really the foundation of the frequentist view of uh, statistics is that you have a fixed parameter in the population, and then you're wanting to estimate that by uh, your from your sample. So we can then apply this to the concept of hypothesis testing. So here I have uh, an example, a uh, two group comparison. Um, so here's my treatment group and the uh, blood pressures, my control group. And so let's say that my uh, study was about uh, some method or some medication or whatever to lower blood pressure. And so um, these are my random samples. Um, and so the question is, is the mean from the treatment group 
uh, of 81 is that statistically different from the mean of 86. And so uh, to answer that question, what we do is we uh, state the null hypothesis. And that's basically that there is no difference, there's no real difference between this, that this difference is just due to random sampling, sampling variability or chance. The alternative hypothesis that we have, of course, is that there is a real difference, that this is uh, a true or meaningful difference in the population. And we'll talk about, you know, meaningful in, in, a, in a little bit. But from a statistical standpoint, then what we're saying um, is that, is this difference uh, just due to random sampling variability, or can we say that it's a real difference in the population? And so when we do our statistical test here, we're going to assume that the null, hop, null hypothesis is true. And then based on our statistical test, we're going to have either two decisions, we're going to have one of two decisions to make. Either we're going to reject the null hypothesis, and we're going to, that if we do that, then we're basically what we're saying is from a statistical standpoint, uh, this difference uh, is, is unlikely to have occurred just by chance. The other decision that we'll make is we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And so this decision is based on our p-value, on what we're going to accept as a um, probability uh, that the uh, null hypothesis uh, can be rejected, or if the p-value is larger than we set, then we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so important points from this, the decision is bivariate. It, it either is significant or it is not significant, okay? And this decision is based on the selected uh, p-value, the alpha error, what we call the alpha error rate. And uh, the alpha error rate is, you can kind of think of it as a willingness to make a wrong decision. So if we make a, a type one error rate, the, the alpha error rate, then what we've done is we've rejected the null hypothesis when in fact the null hypothesis is true. There's no real difference in the population. The other error that we can make is called the beta error. And that's also uh, a statement about our willingness to make a wrong decision. And that is that we fail to reject the null hypothesis when in fact the null hypothesis is false, that is, there's a true difference um, in, the, in the population, okay? So the important point here is that when we do null hypothesis testing, our decision is either reject the null or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so some things about this that I want to um, point out is that the alpha and beta error rates are entirely arbitrary. And the um, P less than 0.05 is what I call an entrenched tradition that comes from Fisher's statement about what he thought would be uh, a reasonable um, error rate. And so why I'm saying that these are arbitrary, if you would set your P value at say 0.01, then if you get a P value of 0.05, that's not statistically significant. In other words, you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if it turns out that your p-value, your alpha error rate is 0.01 or less, then you would reject the null hypothesis. But out of an infinite number of random samples, you would be wrong one out of every 100. Okay, So that's uh, hypothesis testing, uh, or what is meant by hypothesis testing. Uh, and, and the concept of, of, a, of a p-value um, and what you uh, think is, is, a, is a good probability of, of rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. So p-values are a preset level for rejecting the null hypothesis. It's scaled as a probability from 0 to 1. What is often misunderstood is, is um, conceptions of the p-value and what, and so I want to point out what they are not. It's not the probability that the null hypothesis is false, 
And it's not the probability that alternative, that the alternative hypothesis is true, but you actually see that uh, in the literature sometime. And it is certainly not an index of importance or meaningfulness. And so a term that you've probably seen in the literature sometimes is the term highly significant. That actually has no meaning because once you set your alpha level, then you, your decision it is or it isn't. And also another uh, uh, phrase that, that turns up a lot is that you set your p-value at 0.05, but your p-value comes out to be 0.06. Well, so then is that a trend towards significant? Well, that asks, in terms of the hypothesis testing, the null hypothesis testing paradigm, that also has no meaning. So when you see a p-value in the literature, uh, what it means during the meeting. is that uh, what, whatever you set it at is 0.05 or 01 or you set it at 06, that having assumed that the null hypothesis was true, we're going to reject the null hypothesis and we're going to conclude that our statistic that we've calculated, whether it's a T statistic or a chi-square or whatever uh, we're test, um, test we're using, it was unlikely to have occurred by random sampling variability, the chance. Okay, that's all it means. It has uh, no, um, um, I guess I would say qualitative um, um, term attached to it, like highly significant or, or whatever. And so uh, what it means is that if you set your level at 05, then that means that if you were to do repeated sampling that five times out of every 100 samples, you would make a wrong decision. So oftentimes you see if it turns out that the p-value is greater than whatever you set it as, then the only thing that we can do is reject the null hypothesis. And what do you conclude? Well, there's really nothing that you can conclude uh, if you fail to reject the null hypothesis. But often you see in the literature um, a conclusion that there is no difference. Well, that's not a decision uh, or conclusion that you can make. Uh, the best thing you can say is that, well, we found no evidence uh, for a difference. So um, a couple of the things here about uh, p-values is that um, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, then that might mean that we didn't have enough what we call statistical power to detect the difference that actually exists. And so you've sort of seen this in the in the literature where they use the term underpowered. Um, and actually, a, a lot of things that appear in the literature are really underpowered. Um, on the other hand, if you if you reject the null hypothesis with a small sample size, then the results could very well be spurious. Um, and so that kind of relates back to the major problem from this point of view is your sample size. Um, on the other hand, if you reject the null hypothesis with a very I'm large sample meeting. size, then the results may not be uh, all that important. And I'm sure that probably every researcher says, well, yeah, I know the difference between statistically significant and clinically significant. But I think what don't really what is not really understood is um, what uh, how, how the um, statistical significance or not significant is actually used uh, in the literature and I'm going to give an example of that so as I mentioned before the biggest problem uh, for null hypothesis testing from the frequency frequency um, point of view is sample size Okay, so um, <clears throat> I want to then look at uh, in the, specifically in the medical literature and how p-values are misused. And so what I have here is a quote from probably almost any uh, statistical methods section uh, in, a, in a paper. Uh, and uh, the uh, statement there that is, is almost the same and probably 95% of all the articles that you would read is a p-value less than 0.05 was considered significant. So what I want to do is I want to take a, a particular um, 
article from the uh, uh, cardiology literature. Actually, this was presented a couple, several months, couple months ago by one of the cardiology fellows, and I have sort of borrowed his <laughs> article here to sort of illustrate some of the issues related to statistics. So this is really recent. This appeared in Jack in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology a little earlier this year. And I won't go into the details uh, here of what they're doing, other than to say that this is a randomized trial. Uh, they actually took patients from two other randomized trials and uh, randomized them to patients who um, were, their mean arterial pressure was low or high, uh, and then um, looked at primary endpoint, in this case, the area under a troponin curve. Okay. And then so um, they did their analysis and uh, came up with the results that uh, the um, uh, tar targeting um, with the additional use of ionotropes and vasopressor vasopressors was associated with a smaller uh, myocardial injury. The one I want to focus on is their presentation of their results. And so here's the typical table one, uh, your base, baseline characteristics, um, and you, this is almost uh, in every article that you will read in the medical literature. So they have uh, demographics, uh, medical history, and so on. Uh, just th this is just a comparison between the two original studies. Um, the uh, uh, MAP values that they're looking at here are the two groups that they've randomized to. And so you see that for each um, uh, variable in their baseline characteristics here, age, sex, you know, previous AMI, they have a p-value. So they're uh, looking at, uh, they're, they're doing a test of hypothesis of whether this difference was statistically significant or not. And you see that none of the p-values here are uh, less than 0.05. Um, they continue on with their table with arrest characteristics, emission characteristics. And I won't um, show their whole table here, but it turns out that there are 20 different p-values in this table. So they've actually tested 20 hypotheses. And then they actually, they have table two is their angi angiographic findings. And so they have uh, comparisons here between the two groups. And again, they have p-values. And it, uh, as it turns out in this table two, they have actually 10 more tests of hypotheses, uh, 10 more p-values. And then finally we get to um, their table three, which is, one that they really want to um, um, focus on. And we actually have their primary endpoint and their secondary endpoint, so we actually have five more um, p-values or tests of hypotheses. So in all, what they've done is they've tested 35 hypotheses, and they said that significance uh, level was 0 0.05. So, um, the issue here is that um, with that many um, p-values, what can you say about uh, their primary endpoint? And you see that their primary endpoint here is um, a difference between the area under the curve for the um, high pressure group and the low pressure group, um, and that they find a difference uh, of 0.42. And their p-value for that is 0 0.04. Now, in my experience, if when researchers I give them back and you know that we've set the alpha level, give them back the results, and we've set the alpha level at 0 0.05, um, there's sort of a dejection here that the p-value turned out to be 0 0.04. Um, they were sort of hoping for you know 0 0.01 or 0 0.01 or you know 10 to the minus six, but uh, my contention is you should be really happy with this p-value because it's less than what you um, set as your decision to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So based on our p-value here, uh, we can uh, reject the null hypothesis. 
So um, the uh, oh, and one other thing I want to point out here, which you sort of see, is kind of become a way of getting around uh, the idea of multiple p-values uh, in in a study is that uh, p-values for all secondary endpoints are exploratory, and so um, I guess that kind of makes it okay that they present the p-values because uh, they're just exploratory, uh, but it still doesn't negate the fact that they they presented the p-value. They did it hypothesis test. So the uh, concept here is the idea of multiplicity. That is that if you do a large number of hypotheses testing, um, you're going to find statistical significance just by chance. And so this is very typical in tables one or even table two or however many, that a large number of uh, hypotheses were tested and so in this case, if we were to say in our statistical methods section, we tested 35 hypotheses, a two-sided p-value less than 0.05 was considered significant, maybe um, we should raise an eyebrow or two about that. Because if you do multiple hypothesis testing, then you need to make some correction for the inflation of the type 1 error rate, the p-value, the 0.05 or 0.01 or whatever, whatever it is, because as you do more and more hypothesis testing, the type 1 error rate um, is no longer 0.05. It's, you know, great, much greater. It can be much greater than that, depending on how many hypotheses you actually test. So there's a couple of easy solutions to multiplicity. One is just don't list p-values in table 1 or table 2. Uh, and this is the policy of the New England Journal. If you look in uh, more recent um, New England Journal articles, you'll find that Table 1 doesn't include any p-values. Now, that doesn't necessarily uh, prevent the, uh, the author or the authors from actually doing the test of hypotheses, because sometimes in the fine print below the table, you'll see, you know, something like uh, there was no statistically significant difference between any of these variables except for, and, you know, p is 0.03 or something, whatever they get. The other um, solution here, which is uh, what I'm advocating, is to use what we call standardized differences. If you want to look at differences b between patient characteristics uh, or um, whether they're demographics or clinical characteristics. And so standardized differences are essentially um, free of whatever the sample size is. In other words, what we're going to calculate is what we call an effect size at. Uh, gives an idea of how big the difference really is. And so I need to spend a little bit of time talking about standardized differences. And so when you calculate a standardized differences, that corresponds to uh, a percent of non-overlap in the respective distributions of sample statistics. So for example, if we have means here in panel A, I have an example of where there's um, very little non-overlap or there's a lot of overlap. And in panel B, you have where there's uh, uh, more non-overlap between the two distributions. And so, um, the, as I mentioned, the standardized difference is not dependent on how many um, patients you have or how many subjects you have. On, it's not dependent on the sample size. We're simply calculating what the uh, difference is and standardizing that difference. And so, it's actually fairly easy to calculate. So it's essentially the difference in means or the difference in proportions divided by the standard deviation of the difference. And um, in this case, for a mean, it's just the uh, sum of the variances uh, divided by two um, and the same for proportions. And so uh, it's really easy to, uh, to calculate these. And so uh, if we were to go back to uh, table one, and instead of doing p-values here, we do uh, standardized differences. What we would find is that um, now a couple of the um, comparisons that we had before, which were not statistically significant, have fairly large standardized differences. And you say, well, what's you know a large standardized difference? Well. 
that's arbitrary just like p values are but what that means is is that uh, a standardized difference of a 0.3 or minus 0.3 it just depends on which way you subtract um, here is is getting to be a fairly large difference and so in fact if we look at um, this table I've just picked out some standardized difference values and then the corresponding percent of non-overlap in the um, distributions. So if you can see, if we have a standardized difference of 0.3, that we have better than 20% non-overlap. Um, if you have a uh, standardized difference of 0.5, then it's about 33% non-overlap. And then as the standardized difference gets larger, um, it can, you know, go up to whatever, uh, however large a number you can, can imagine. Um, the difference uh, between the two distributions gets even bigger. So here we, if you get it to 0.9 or, or 1, in terms of the standardized difference, it's about, you know, over 50% uh, non-overlap. Um, so instead of uh, using p-values um, to compare you know, baseline characteristics, standardized difference is a much way to, much better way to do that. You're not using up, um, you know, you're not uh, doing multiple hypothesis testing. Um, and it actually gives you more information than a p-value uh, does. So if we go back to our uh, study that we were looking at, then the um, primary endpoint, um, with a p-value of 0.04, uh, if we had uh, not done all the other uh, 34 tests of hypotheses, we could conclude um, that, well, okay, it, it, we can reject the null hypothesis, and we could uh, conclude or we could argue that uh, the chance of that difference being just due to random sampling variability is, is low, um, then we would be able to make that conclusion. However, because we've tested 35 hypotheses, if you do any kind of correction for the type 1 error rate, then 0.04 is not going to be statistically significant. Okay? So what I want to um, end up with is um, a um, kind of how I would rewrite um, this article in terms of its statistical methods and its uh, conclusions. Now, I'm not going to send this into the, um, you know, to to the journal editor and and uh, um, you know argue that this is the way they should have done it. But anyway, if I was going to do it, then um, uh, there, I, what I have here is their statement in their statistical methods section. And they say all tests were two-sided and assessed at a significance level of 5%. And then they, you know, give the exploratory nature of the study. They didn't do any adjusting for multiple testing. So the way I would state this um, is that I would use standardized differences uh, to compare uh, um, between the two groups with respect to baseline characteristics, findings, secondary endpoints. And then the primary endpoint area under the troponin curve was compared between both groups using a, an Eltrin test that included study as a stratification factor. Uh, actually, this is sort of one really uh, positive thing about the study is they recognize that taking uh, patients from two different studies is, is a potential problem. So they um, uh, do a test that, that takes that into account. So instead of saying, uh, that all tests were assessed at a significance level of 0.05, I would say that the alpha error rate for assessment of random sampling variability or the play of chance with respect to the differences in AUCs was set at less than 0 0.05. Okay, so what I'm trying to do by wording it this way is to eliminate the idea that if it is statistically significant, then we have a necessarily meaningful um, result, okay? 
Um, and then so the way that they uh, state their results uh, about the difference in, in AUC curves is that they say that it was associated with a significant reduction in myocardial cardial injury. Okay, so here's what I mean by uh, statistical significance being sort of the sole uh, criteria by which you judge um, uh, importance or meaningfulness or not. So the way that I would say this <clears throat> uh, is just exactly like they said it at the beginning, except that uh, I would actually give what the uh, percent reduction is. So um, it was associated with a 37% reduction of myocardial injury. And then the parentheses, I would put the random sampling variability error rate, uh, P equals 0.04. Now you could leave the P out of that and just say that the sampling vari random sampling variability error rate um, is 0.04. Uh, but I put P in there since uh, it may be that readers uh, when, don't understand the concept here of random sampling variability. Okay, so uh, let me conclude here. Um, by saying a couple of things. So the p-value uh, in a randomized study is just one checkbox for study validity. Um, and it's a checkbox for random sampling variability. That is, uh, what is the play of chance in the results that you got? And that's all that it does. Okay, another thing is that uh, I'm going to recommend using standardized differences for comparisons that are not the main study hypotheses. Um, if you have an observational study, then that's, that's a whole different uh, discussion. Uh, actually, if you have observational data, then p-values really don't mean anything. Um, I'll um, maybe clarify that in later um, sessions. So, um, what you should report, and it is often reported in, in most um, journals, are confidence intervals, although what the confidence interval that's usually lacking is the confidence interval of the difference in um, the groups or two or three groups or however many groups you have. And you should probably report effect sizes, which I very rarely can ever remember actually seeing what those are. Uh, if you report p-values, um, do it at, you know, two or three decimal places at the most. Um, I've seen articles where they've carried the p-value out to, I don't know, eight, eight or ten decimal places. Uh, and I think that was just to show how many zeros were in front of um, the uh, um, um, non-zero <laughs> value, but that's, that's unnecessary. Um, because remembering that the, you're making a decision of either to reject the null or fail to reject the null. Um, and then um, the official ASA position, don't use the term statistically significant or non-significant. And make conclusions based on the science or your intelligence, not p-values. And so um, I want to say um, that in the last a um, couple of weeks, I've written several uh, results sections, and, and I will tell you, it's, it's hard not to use the term statistically significant or non-significant. Non but I think there's a way of saying that where you avoid the uh, idea that um, the statistical significance is really defining, defining your study. And actually, my thought is that that should really free researchers from the um, uh, sort of the uh, statistical significance um, bind that they, you know, that they get into uh, in, in um, you know, um, submitting their papers for, um, for publication. Um, now, the other issue, and maybe some of you have already asked this, is, is um, um, okay, so say I do this, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to get back from the editor of the journal or the reviewers, hey, where are the p-values here? What, you know? <laughs> and so um, 
I recognize that. So does the American Statistical Association saying that may be a while before they can really get away from using the term statistically significant or non-significant. Um, I have uh, a number of references um, here uh, that you can uh, look up, or if you can't find them, I actually have uh, them and can send them to you. Uh, I have uh, the several by Fisher and Neiman, um, uh, and they had uh, something of a debate, uh, well, actually kind of turned into a nasty debate. Uh, they had some kind of unkind things to say about each other um, in, their, um, in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. Um, some of the others, the uh, uh, ASA uh, statement on p-values and their moving to a world beyond uh, p less than 05 or in the American statistician. Um, the abandoned statistical significance was in the same, uh, same journal. And then the last two, Austin and Yang, those are uh, references that are related to um, using standardized differences. Uh, uh, the, the first one is, is uh, sort of the kind of the rationale for using them. The last one is just sort of more of how to um, compute them using, using SAS. So uh, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I think we have a few minutes um, for questions. Uh, let's see if I can find, can I find the chat <laughs> um, up here? Let's see if there are any. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, so the question here is, um, aren't standardized differences, oh, let's see, there was more than that to the question. Are standardized differences linearly proportional to p-values? Um, uh, and if so, aren't standardized differences just a proxy for p-values and vice versa? Well, there, there is something of a linear relationship, yes, because as you um, saw in, in the, in the um, article, table one, that uh, some of the p-values that had the biggest, uh, turned out to have the biggest standardized differences were or um, were smaller than, than a lot of the other ones. So there is a, is a relation, um, uh, you know, ship there. But um, the point that I want to bring out by using standardized differences is that it, it actually gives you uh, an indication of what the difference actually is. P-values don't. What P-values are telling you um, is uh, whether the difference you got is um, um, related to ch associated with chance. Uh, in other words, if you sampled over and over again, uh, you would get this result by chance, you know, one out of a hundred times, five out of a hundred times, one out of a thousand times. That's all that it's telling you. Uh, whereas the standardized difference gives you uh, an index of how big the difference actually is. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, another question is, can you shed some light on hypothesis testing for observation data? Well, um, that's sort of a whole nother um, topic, but basically if you have observation data, then, then technically a hypothesis testing doesn't apply. And the reason for that is in observational data, you have a lot of potential biases, biases selection bias being um, one of the... Um, uh, main ones. Uh, to do hypothesis testing with observational data, you have to uh, do something like creating propensity scores. You have to um, create uh, a pseudo randomized, um, you know, group, two groups or three groups or however many um, you have. So um, I'll, I'll maybe in, uh, in another session, I'll, I'll uh, touch on that a, a little bit more, but if you do have observational data, um, you really do need to talk to a statistician about how you uh, want to analyze and, and answer your questions. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. 
Okay. Right. So, so the, the question here is what do you do with a situation where we have to use yes or no to make decisions? Um, for example, the FDA to approve or not approve. Well, um, right. In this, in, in this case, if you have randomized uh, studies, um, then, then yes, you, you, you would have a p-value. You would need to set whatever it is. Uh, and, and that's sort of the problem, as I alluded to. Um, almost every um, RFA or RFP um, you get from you know, any um, grant institution, grant, um, granting institution, requires you to come up with, have a p-value, requires you to do a um, power analysis, uh, uh, sample size calculation and such. Um, but um, in, in, um, in using the p-values, I think what, what is important and what I'm trying to communicate here is that we need to understand what p-values are saying and not to make the decision solely on the point, on the, on the basis of a p-value. Uh, how that's going to change, um, I don't know. In the uh, ASA's um, uh, statement, uh, they said, well, it could take some time to really change people's thinking <laughs> about this, and that's probably the case. Um, yeah, so a uh, question about if you exclude p-values from your tables, how do you respond to reviewers, editors, if you include them? So um, in, in uh, uh, I guess I've, I've come to the point where if in, for example, table one, uh, where you give your baseline characteristics and I provide uh, standardized differences rather than p-values, I'm going to go head to head with the editors or the reviewers and say, well, you know, here's the, here's the problem with doing that uh, and argue that what you need to have here are standardized differences. Um, and so um, as far, uh, and that maybe that doesn't help you because you're, it may still be that your, um, um, you know, the editors or reviewers are going to still, well, you know, I still want to see the p-values. So um, another thing you could do is present the p-values and the standardized differences, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that works out. Uh, and then the suggestions for writing the results. Um, um, well, I think the examples I gave for the study that we looked at uh, are kind of a, and use as kind of maybe a template. That is where the p-value is not the centerpiece of whether a study is important or not or is useful or not. And that we uh, um, sort of record uh, or that we um, um, ba base it on, um, you know, the science, not on the p-value. Um, so, um, and, and I think that actually most researchers, uh, most investigators actually do this in their discussion section because often, most of the time, discussion sections don't have um, p-values, although sometimes they do. Has joined uh, the meeting. But um, uh, they would, um, uh, you know, sort of talk about more about the science and why this you know, finding or difference or whatever it is that their hypothesis is, is, is important. So I think my, my thinking is that, that investigators are actually doing, uh, wanting to do the right thing, but they're sort of, in a sense, kind of bound by the p-value uh, uh, problem and, uh, uh, you know, how, how we're going to change that, I think, is, is um, um, you know, something that, that hopefully we can do in the future. Uh, there's actually a, a study, um, a, um, a proposal for funding where I sort of actually sort of did this without, you know, mentioning p-values, and we'll, we'll sort of see how that goes. Um, okay, so let's see, is there... Um, 
So standardized differences are from standardized estimates. So should standardized estimates be reported instead of unstandardized ones? Um, yeah, my feeling, yes, it should, because if you just report the difference, um, there's, um, I mean, you can report that. Um, uh, that's subject to variability. In other words, if you have, say, a mean difference, well, that's, there's variability associated with that mean difference and giving you a standardized um, difference that allows you to um, present that for whatever type of data the um, you're, you're comparing. So like if you have age, um, then you can, you know, uh, say, say do gender, then uh, uh, the standardized difference has the same meaning, even though those are two different uh, statistics. So um, let me check the time here. Um, if you if you do have um, any questions, um, email me. Uh, I think that's still up on the screen there. Uh, and so I want to thank you again for um, your participation in this. So it's a little strange. This is the first time I've ever done a remote presentation. It's um, I've always done sort of face to face, which are a little more interesting. But hopefully, this uh, was a um, uh, uh, a, a medium that uh, you know we can we can work with and and still communicate the uh, ideas that uh, we want to uh, communicate. So in the future, um, I'm going to um, still be probably fairly controversial. Um, uh, next month, we're going to look at um, uh, regression models and uh, uh, some of the things that I have to uh, say about building regression models. So again, thank you for your time. Uh, have a good afternoon. Mark Blackman. Has